morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm relieved to see some new faces from the last time I gave my testimony. I didn't want to be that guy that tells the same story over and over to the same people. That's your great story. It's your story. Yeah, it is certainly a kind of a climactic type of conversion experience, much different than my wife, who grew up in a godly home and knew the Lord most, you know, all of her life. I'm going to do something a little different this time. Since I have a little more time to prepare, I'm going to interject a few <coughs> spiritual thoughts, some spiritual truths that kind of describe the circumstances around a conversion and what happened in my life and, you know, what takes place in most people's lives. So start, you know, of course, I have to start with my parents. Um, my mom and dad met during the war. Oh, I'm Dave Kemper. <laughs> Uh, my mom and dad met in the war, during the war, World War II. My dad was in the Air Force, and he was an instructor. He was instructing pilots and sending them off to war. He was from Texas, but was stationed in Sacramento, and that's where my mom was. She was a farm girl. Now, my mom was, come from, came from a Catholic home, Catholic background. My dad came from Church of Christ, non-instrumental, which... It's very prevalent in, in Texas. My dad was real charming, very handsome, and kind of sweet my mom off her feet. And uh, they're in Sacramento. And there were some issues between family, you know, Catholic. They kind of disowned my mom because she wasn't marrying, you know, in the Catholic faith. And um, a few things she didn't know about my, my dad that I learned later is my dad, before he met my mom, was engaged and engaged to be married, all the way up to the wedding day. And so here we are at the wedding day, the bride was waiting at the church, dressed, everything was set, all the people were there. My dad gets up and goes and plays tennis. Just abandoned. No call, nothing. He just I played tennis. And I asked him about that story, and my dad always never <laughs> would remember. So I don't know what went on in his life, what kind of childhood he had, but I suspect it wasn't the best. So it kind of shaped what kind of man that he was. Well, my mom wanted a big family, lots of kids. My dad wanted none. So they settled on having two kids. So after they were married in Sacramento, they moved to Texas, and my oldest brother was born, Michael. And then uh, a little girl came, uh, Karen, my sister, and they were done. No more kids. Well, at seven, my sister Karen died of polio. It happened in a three-day three period. She didn't feel well. Three days later, she was dead. And, of course, that was just excruciating and devastating to my mom. In fact, my older brother told me that at the funeral, mom draped herself over the casket and everyone had to pull her off. And that really had an impact on my older brother. So anyway, mom wanted to have another girl, so Jeff was born and then I was born. <laughs> so in a way, you know, if Karen hadn't passed, uh, you know, I wouldn't be standing here today. I certainly look forward to the day that I get to meet her. I want to share a little insight here, since we're talking about <coughs> birth and my beginning. Everyone that's born, I want to dispel some of the teaching that is around today. This idea that you're born sinful, that you're born morally deprived, you're born separated from God, you're born without a free will, you're born with a sinful nature. These things are not true. What is true is that we're born innocent. Amen. I was born innocent. Every single one of you were born innocent. We are neither virtuous or sinful. Okay? It requires an understanding of right and wrong, and then you make a choice before virtue or sinfulness can be applied to you. So we are, we're born innocent. But because of the fall, because of Adam and sin, something did change. Adam and Eve were removed from the garden. They didn't have access to the tree of life anymore. Don't quite know exactly what that might mean, 
but it had an effect on our physical bodies. And death came into the world. And not just to man, but all of the universe is decaying. You know, everything is deteriorating, everything is decaying, and same with man. Man now experiences pain, sickness, eventually ends up dying, and just certain aspects within that physical frame that we are born in, there are some changes that happen because of the fall. That change is considered, in a, in a theological term, it's called phys a physical depravity. So we're not born with a moral depravity, but we are born with a physical depravity. And I'm going to give a description of that. Our weakened and unbalanced physical condition constitutes what we call physical depravity and contributes to the development of moral depravity. In other words, it doesn't cause, but it does influence. Physical depravity is not to be thought of as a loss of ability of free will or as moral depravity, which must be voluntary, but as introducing a bias or tendency towards self-gratification, an obstacle which must be overcome by right moral action. It should be understood that we have a natural influence towards virtue when our conscience is developed. But before it is developed, we only have a constitutional influence towards self-gratification. In the development of a child, their flesh, with its passions and desires, is developed long before their mind or conscience is developed. By the time they reach the age of accountability, children have developed a habit of self-indulgence, self-gratification. That is why children choose to continue in selfish in a, in a selfish state, even after they know better. The self-centeredness of a child is natural and normal at first, and even necessary for their survival, but it comes simple once they know better. I will attest to that. In, in my, as, as I think back, as far back as I can think of my young years, that I certainly had this physical depravity. Um, as far back as I can remember, my desire was to have fun, to simply play and do what it is that I wanted to do. My parents, you know, as best they could, tried to instill in me some principles, some truths of, you know, of right and wrong. And I remember probably the best one that I remember is this idea that you treat others as you want to be treated. But they, I, I kind of viewed that as, you know what, let people do what they want to do, so you let me do what I want to do. <laughs> kind of approach. So, you know, and, and my mom and dad raising me, I had this, um, what would they would probably call ADD today, had a lot of energy, uh, 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 just a desire to constantly be stimulated, all right, and just like I said, to constantly have fun. And the kind of fun I like to have, the way I like to play, I guess you could call it extreme play. My kids, no, don't you do this. <coughs> when I was five years old, it was on a weekend and there was no school, got up fairly early, I remember being outside, bored stiff, just bored. So I got my bike and I said, okay, I, I got to come up with something. I just got to do something. So I got my bike. I went down the street, a couple of doors, turned the corner, went down to the next block, went up that street, maybe about halfway, and I said, okay, I'm going to ride this over and over and over and over until I can do it with my eyes closed. So I did that. I don't know how many times I rode that. I counted the pedals, estimated the speed. I'm a five-year-old. I go over there, I close my eyes, I get on that bike, and I start riding with my eyes closed. All the way down the street, I made the turn, made the next turn, and I was just a little off center, and there was a car parked on the side of the road, and these cars had a handle that you would grab and you take that handle and you crank it down, so there was a little gap. Well, I hit, my arms were like this, I hit the car, and I was going fairly fast, and went, and that handle went into my arm here, and I was pinned, hanging on the door frame. Of course, I pull it out, run into the house, fall on the ground, 
my older brother, who's 11 years older, comes, sees it, he passes out. Oh. <laughs> my mom comes out of the kitchen, sees him first, and goes to him, and then she sees me. And I remember her running, she had a hot pad, she put the hot pad on my arm. So that was the first <laughs> time that I probably could have killed myself. Uh, later that, I had, I don't know, 300 stitches, it got gangrene, I was within a day or so of losing my arm. And uh, finally that fever broke and I was able to save my arm. But throughout the rest of my life, that arm was a real leverage against my brothers. Anytime they would touch me, oh, my arm, my arm. <laughs> so they would get in trouble. From, uh, from there, as I got older, uh, I started competitive swimming. My dad used to play tennis and joined a club. At this time, we lived in Sacramento. And he joined a um, swimming racket club. And they had a swim team. So. While he was playing tennis, mom decided, you know, let's get the kids, Jeff and myself, into swimming. And so we started to swim and involved in, we were pretty good swimmers and all of a sudden I'm swimming four hours a day. Two hours in the morning, two hours after school. Um, never a very good student, I was just too hyper, all I wanted to do was play and have fun whenever I could. Now, the swimming I think kind of kept me out of trouble, maybe that was my mom's plan. Because if I'm swimming in the pool, I can't be off doing other crazy things. So that continued and that kind of took over our life. Um, my dad was the type of man that uh, he was just there. I never really felt like, loved or, or um, uh, praised by him. He was just always there. He was the one that made the money. He's the one that provided for the family. And that was it. He never really took me aside, never really taught me anything, never took me fishing, you know. But that was fine, you know, because my mother really made up for it, plus my own ability to entertain myself. <laughs> I didn't need anybody or anything. And growing up in Sacramento, there were fields everywhere. So I spent all my free time, whenever I could, out in the fields, climbing every tree, uh, crossing every creek building forts, a lot of the time by myself, just hunting for snakes and lizards and things like that. And just, this is what I, how I was driven. I just constantly wanted to be entertaining myself, stimulating myself. And I was building that pattern of just, you know, serving self, doing for self. And my mom, bless her heart, um, she loved us kids like none other. She, we, she would cook, constantly the most fabulous breakfast and lunch and dinner and she would bake. She had her own gardens, all pies and cookies and ice cream. And uh, when I would get sick, I remember often getting sick, I'd have ear infections because I was swimming. And she'd spend up, stay up all night, she would take a, a hand towel, put it in the oven along with others and heat them up and then she'd bring them and put them on, on my <coughs> ear and she'd do that every 15 minutes all night. So there was this connection that I certainly had with my mother. And I'll say that that connection had an impact on me to help me modify my behavior a little bit. I saw how my older brother, he was 11 years older than me, he, you know, got in, he would drink and cut school. Cut school and got speeding tickets, I think one year, in 19, he got 11 speeding tickets in one year. And I saw how my mom would weep over him. So that, that kind of had an impact on me and started to establish a little bit of consciousness. You know, I didn't want to disappoint my mom. I didn't want to hurt her. So it, it helped modify my behavior. So I didn't drink. I didn't cuss. I didn't steal. I didn't do these kind of things. But at my core, I was selfish. I didn't want to help, I wouldn't offer to help, all I ever wanted to do was play. When I couldn't play, I was dreaming about playing. And it was just that simple to me. So leading from there, as we got old, as I got older, uh, because of swimming, we, we left Sacramento and we moved to the Bay Area, which is Cupertino, this is in California. 
all for swimming. There was a swim club there called uh, Santa Clara International, and George Haynes was the coach. He was an Olymp the men's Olympic coach. And we moved there basically for swimming. And we had, I attended Cupertino High School. One of my best friends was John Henkin. He was a world record holder in the 100, 200 meter breaststroke. Had three gold medals in the 72 Olympics. Uh, those were the kind of the caliber of swimmer that I swam with. Uh, Mark Spitz, maybe some of you heard of Mark Spitz. He was four years ahead of me. And uh, so at school, swimming kept me out of a lot of trouble. But I still fostered my selfishness. I loved sports. I got a chance to start playing water polo uh, in, in, when we moved to Cupertino. And sure enough, I ended up getting a scholarship, a full ride, um, to Colorado. I had lots of offers, I don't know, a couple of dozen offers from a lot of D1 schools. And I chose Colorado State. I was interested in the outdoors, I liked the mountains, you know. I hadn't really connected with the ocean yet. You know, I enjoyed the ocean, but I was more interested in the mountains, so that's why I went to Colorado. And that was my dawn, my real downfall. I was 17, and I got away from my mom and dad, and I was on my own for, you know, for the first time at 17. And here's this school of 25,000 students in the middle of Colorado, these gorgeous mountains and skiing, and needless to say, I started drinking, I started uh, getting involved with different girls, and uh, my life just went to pot. And I developed a skill. Um, I had a way of making fun of people. I don't know if anybody knows who Don Knox, or uh, Don Rickles. But you know who Don Rickles is? He just made a career out of making fun of people. So I, of course, began to do that. Everything was a big joke to me, you know, and I'd just make fun of the coach. I'd make fun of, you know, different players. I had all sorts of people wanting to, you know, fight beat me up, um, and all I wanted to do was drink, party, go skiing, um, I'd cut class and go to the gym, play racquetball, I mean, it's all paid for, <laughs> it was like, you could say just, uh, just a resort to me. And not having drank before, this was a whole new thing to me, so I began to drink and my life began to spiral downward. And the whole time, in the back of my mind, I always had this idea about my mom, you know. I just didn't want to break my mom's heart, but I knew she knew these things. So you begin to leave this secret life. There's the life, the person who I really am, and then there's the person that I want and hope that my mom would see. And uh, for some reason, it wasn't that hard to do, uh, so I began to do that. Well. Uh, I lost my scholarship, uh, things didn't go well at that school, I had to come back home. Uh, I flunked out even the last semester, I don't even think I went to class. So I come back home, this is Cupertino, and enrolled in uh, junior college. So I was going to start attending this junior college. During the summer I was a lifeguard, swim instructor, and a swimming pool, you know, for kids. And um, so I started at Anza, and I played water polo there. And the coach from the, uh, San Jose State would come and use our facility. We had a long course pool, meter pool. Uh, San Jose State was old and had an old indoor pool. It was you know only 25 yards. So they would come and work out there. And he spotted me. He knew who I was, you know, from my past and everything. And so he started trying to recruit me, wanted me to come and swim for, you know, for San Jose. And he just went in on deaf ears, and I'm not interested, I'm not interested, you know. Finally, coming close to Christmas time, spring break, he said, for spring break, or for Christmas break, I'm taking the team to Hawaii. So if you come to San Jose, I'll take you on that trip, we're going to be gone for 10 days, all expenses paid, he just wanted me to pay $100, and uh, you know, I would get, go to Hawaii, of course at this time I was you know, surfing whenever I could surf, that really kind of became my god, 
And I said to him, okay, coach, I'll do this, but I work out once a day. I'm not doing this <laughs> two workouts a day. And I don't go any faster than I did in high school. But he agreed to that. And well, this really wasn't a school that was known for swimming. So my high school times would pretty much break most of the records there at San Jose. So I did that, got to go to Hawaii for 10 days, I six hours a day surfing. Surf Sunset Beach, Pipeline, Haleiwa, you know, all these great places over in, in Hawaii. So surfing in between workouts, and then came back to college and had to figure out some courses to take, right? Decided, you know what, I'm gonna major in the easiest thing I can, can major in. So my course schedule was badminton, volleyball, uh, water safety instructor, scuba diving. So, yes, those are college courses. Uh, I want to relate back, go back when I was in Colorado before this. I want to tell you this little incident I have. Uh, the assistant swim coach didn't care for me. He saw a lot of wasted talent, and that was kind of my story. For most of my life, my swimming career, every coach didn't like me because I was nothing but wasted talent. They knew I could do better, I could go faster if I wanted to. Well, this guy, the idea of being a good swimmer, excelling at swimming was everything to him. And he could not stand the fact that I was wasting the talent that I had. Well, I took a course there in Colorado. It was water safety instructor, probably about 20, 25 college students, and he was the instructor. Well, what if safety instructor is knowing how to rescue, you know, rescue somebody. And a lot of times, you know, somebody that's drowning, as you try to help them, they're going to, you know, jump on you, grab you, and there's ways of getting out, you know, grab their elbow and shift your, shift your weight and turn them around on their back. And so these are the things that they instruct you in. Well, I don't know, probably three quarters of the way into this class, he had everybody go over to the dive tank. And we were all standing along the edge of the pool here, and he said, Kemper, get in. I want you to start swimming back and forth. And we're going to test, see how well you do it, you know, getting off of, get somebody off of you. So, all right, so I get in the pool, and I start swimming, you know, back and forth. It's a 20-foot deep pool. Well, this guy, this guy's in his late 20s, early 30s, really fit, super strong, right? He jumps on me locks his legs around mine, goes under my arm and around my neck, and he grasps me like, I mean, he's like, I'm locked. There's no way in the world a drowning person could do what he was doing to me, right? Well, he wanted to make an example, you know, he just wanted to kind of embarrass me. Well, I knew I could hold my breath longer than him. I could hold my breath easily five minutes. I says, all right, this is what you're going to do? I just relaxed. I just let go and I sank down to the bottom, 20 feet, all the way down to the bottom, and I'm just laying there limp, just biding my time. I knew eventually he'd have to let go and go up to the surface. Sure enough, a minute or so, he lets go and he starts up. I reach up and I grab him around the ankle and I pull him back down. He's kicking, he's trying to kick me. I grab his suit, yank his suit off. <laughs> <laughs> and then I let him go, and then I swim underwater over to the other side and came up. And he comes up and he's just, <laughs> you know, and he's naked. And everybody's laughing. And <laughs> so, anyway, one of my things I uh, would do to people. So, anyway, back to San Jose State. Go to, we go to Hawaii. All I do is surf. We come back. And then that summer after that is when I went down to San Clemente uh, as a lifeguard. I met a friend. He was a beach guard in San Clemente. That's halfway between L.A. and San Diego. And uh, you had to try out. So I went down for tryouts. There's like 300 young people, kids, you know, wanting to become lifeguards. It's very difficult to become a lifeguard. So over 300, and you had to do this swim. It's, I don't know, a quarter mile out, a quarter mile back, out in the ocean around this buoy, and you come back. And then on the beach, there were these flags, the 
strings with flags on them, and they would funnel to uh, where only one person could come in, and then, then it extended. So as you came in, you would funnel into that and, and go in. Well, only 20 people could get into lifeguard training. So the top 20 would make it. So sure enough, I get out there, easy swim for me. I, I get out there, I come back, I come out on the beach, and you know, I'm way ahead of everybody. So I'm, a, I'm just walking. I'm walking up the beach, and I see this guy, the second guy come in, and he's sprinting. He's sprinting, man, he's got to beat me, and I'm just walking. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so I let him go ahead. And he, so I got second, and all the lifeguards, this whole mentality that I had with my swim coaches, another waste <laughs> with this, this, you know, no uh, competitiveness. That they, they didn't like that attitude. But it was good enough to get me into lifeguard training, so I went into lifeguard training. That was a few months after uh, being accepted, and it was a, a seven-day course of instructions, and every day you'd have a competition, all sorts of different things. And you were always given this, like, popsicle stick with a number, 1 through 20. And each day you'd have to take a test, some kind of test on... Uh, uh, lifeguard procedures or um, uh, obstacle courses. Yeah, and also if if you're injured, uh, what's that called? Uh, safe, um, first aid. First aid. Thank you. <laughs> so a lot of tests on first aid, and you were given these sticks. Well, I won every one of those competitions. I always got number one. In fact, one of the events, uh, I set some kind of record that, I don't know, for how many years they've been doing this event. But everybody had to lay on their back. You started on the beach, you laid on your back. When they blew the whistle, you flipped over, and then you had to run, I don't know, about a quarter mile to the pier. You had to run out to the end of the pier, jump off this 50-foot pier, swim about a quarter mile around a buoy, swim in about a quarter mile, then run a half mile down and a half mile back. And I, you know, I did that. It was a breeze. And I, I don't know, apparently I set some kind of record. But, uh, so coming out of lifeguard training, I was number one to be hired. And sure enough, um, I was bugging them, calling them, you know, when can I come down, when can I start? And most new guards don't show up until middle of August, almost the end of, uh, uh, excuse me, the middle of July to the beginning of August, because they just didn't need a full... Uh, Employment, they didn't need all that many lifeguards. There was like 58, 56 lifeguards in that department. And so the chances of me getting called down to work was probably going to be not until August, and that only be for a couple of weeks. And my buddy, who was a guard there, told me, Dave, you're not going to, you know, be called down. Well, I kept calling, and they brought me down in March. So I got to go with a, a lieutenant. And it was still fairly cold. No other lifeguards were there as far as who was going to work the towers. And it was just the lieutenants and the captains and these people. And the lieutenants would drive around in jeeps and kind of patrol the beach. There weren't many people on the beach. But my first rescue, I was with the lieutenant, and there were these two guys going out scuba diving. And here we are in this beach with a beach break. And I mean, there were white foam waves coming in, probably 20 to 25 rows of waves coming in. You're talking a probably half mile out is where all the waves were really breaking and it was a, a big day. It was a big surf day. And these guys, they, they were going to go out in this uh, motorized like pontoon raft. And they had all their diving gear and everything. We went up there and go, you guys aren't going out there, are you? And, oh yeah, we're going out there, no problem. So we parked and you know, just just wait. So sure, <laughs> they get through that white water and everything. They get up where the big wave is and they go up and they just shoot, boom, right, flipped right over, lost everything. So I start swimming out there and go to the, you know pick up the first guy and I almost had to save the lieutenant. He was struggling, but he ended up making it and came in. Then I let the guy let go and he could walk because their girlfriends were there. They didn't want to be embarrassed, <laughs> so I let him go, and that was my 
first rescue, and for the summer I ended up having 72 rescues. But the whole time it was all about partying, and uh, the lifeguards, they would allow you if, if someone had a day off, you could trade with somebody who would, had, had to work, and you could take their day off, which I always did. So I had a work day, a friend of mine would have a day off, I'd trade. So I was only working four days a week, so I could just surf and party. Hey, well, by this time, um, I was making it, had to make a decision about my life. I hadn't forgotten about my mom, and I knew that if she knew how I was living, I was going to break her heart. And I was beginning to realize I had to make a decision. I just had to break her heart, get it over with, let her know the life that I'm going to live. It's going to be a lifeguard ski instructor or ski patrol in the winter and just live this life of exhilaration and, and fun and pleasure. So I hardened my heart. So I want to read you something here, some comments about a hardened heart, which I had. A hardened heart, hardness of heart is a voluntary state of mind. It is the will in a state of choice. A will committed, for the time being, to some form of selfishness. And the term hardness is appropriately used because when the heart is in this state, it is stubborn and will not yield to the truth. And prevents the intelligence and sensibility from perceiving and being duly impressed by the truth. Hardness of heart is, and here's some added characteristics of a hardened heart. Lacking genuine sorrow over sin. Continuing to go back again and again into temptation, lies, and deceit. Choosing to think of yourself is more important. Choosing what's best for you and not, and not others. The small lies and the huge lies that you convince yourself are not a big deal. Being unteachable. Tearing down with words. Comparing and contrasting your wrongs against others and making a judgment that theirs are worse. Responding with defensiveness, the need to always be in control, waiting for the other to say sorry first, demanding that others change first, thinking more of what you deserve instead of what you can give, focusing more on being right than, being, than on becoming righteous. <coughs> What you can get out of someone instead of how you can invest in them. The refusal to forgive. The refusal to humble yourself to ask for forgiveness. Saying you forgive, but never letting go. Asking for forgiveness and then going back to do the same thing again. Magnifying the weaknesses and minimizing the strength of others, while magnifying the strength and minimizing the weaknesses of yourself. Justifying wrong action because they started it first. Preserving your own well-being at the expense of others. And this last one. Reading this list and thinking that it's for somebody else to read. And that's a hardened heart. Those are the characteristics of a hardened heart. And that's what I had done within my own heart. It had become stubborn, self-serving. I could not, I was in darkness. I had chosen to deceive myself. And I suppressed the truth. Whatever little truth, whatever little consciousness I had, I had suppressed it so I could do what I wanted to do. And while I was there, I met uh, this young girl who um, I was mm, trying to get her to go out with me for the first few months that I was there. And these girls were fed up with the lifeguards, that these lifeguards would come in for the summer, and then they would leave. So they'd come and party and have fun with all these girls, and they're local girls, and then we would leave. And she wanted to protect herself from that. The lifeguards are too fun. The lifeguards and the parties that we had and the things that we did, and of course, you know, we're all athletic, fairly good looking, good physique, so I wore her down, and finally uh, she and I started to date and kind of hook up together, probably the last three or four weeks that I was there. Well, she was a Mormon, 
And as my affections grew for her, and I was, you know, so interested in her, I began to kind of reflect on my own life. And this was the beginning. This was the little thing that was happening in my life that was beginning to just to soften me and consider who it was that I was. Knowing that she was a Mormon concerned me. You know, this, this is not of God. This is not, this is a false religion. And this girl is, is entrapped by this. And of course, what comes to my mind, who am I to say? You know, who am I to say that this is wrong, given my state? Well, I left uh, San Clemente, I left her, I went back home, and things began to kind of unravel for me. I was getting fatigued of every time I was encountering friends and schoolmates, they were all attacking me, because that's what I did to them. So I always had to be on guard. It was starting to get laborious, it was beginning fatiguing, somebody always making fun of you, and I always had to have a comeback. And so that was no fun. And trying to always keep myself entertained and pleasured was not working out. It just wasn't as fun any, anymore. So this brings me close to where my conversion happens. I want to kind of explain to you what, what transpires at conversion. Conversion is a turning around or transformation implying a turning from, from and a turning to. A complete change from living for self to living for the glory of God and the happiness of one's fellow man. Conversion is not when a person makes some weak decision for Christ at an altar. What does not change or affect his life. True conversion is when a person decides to bear his cross and follow the Lord, when he chooses to forsake everything for Jesus. This is the choice of the will to live a new life, to turn from sin and to turn to Christ. It is the decision of the heart to no longer live selfish, a selfish life, but to live a holy life that is pleasing and glorifying to God. True conversion to Jesus Christ involves conviction of sin, confession of sin, cleansing from sin by the blood of Christ, and the concentration, consecration of the whole person to love and serve God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are three phases that kind of transpire in conversion, and as I explain to you what happens to me, it incorporates these phases. A person who really been converted to Christ experiences three distinctly different phases which may extend over quite an extended period. My conversion lasted about two weeks. The first phase is a definite time of awakening to his lost condition and that there is a God and, I'm and that you are responsible to him for your conduct. The second phase is a period of enlightenment during which he is informed of what God is trying to do with him. And it isn't to get him to agree to go to heaven. He must learn that good teaching shows him he is separated from God because of his rebellious heart. And sin needs to be reconciled to God by repentance and faith in Christ and be willing to cooperate with God to make himself a new heart or purpose of life. The third he must do to become a Christian is to be reconciled to God and his fellow man. To be reconciled to God means to restore to favor with God and man, to cause one thing to cease and another to take its place. We shall let Christ have what he died for, and that is you and me. This explains kind of what transpires in conversion. Of course, I wasn't aware of these things at the time. So now I'm back home, left this girl who was a Mormon, we were still staying in contact, I was beginning to be fatigued by the life I was living, the drinking, the party, and the surfing, making fun of people, my filthy mouth, living two lives, one in front of my parents and this other life. And I knew I had to make a break. I had to just break my mom's heart and get on with it. And then one night, kind of in this turmoil, I was sitting home in the family room, and my dad looked at me. And 
this turmoil was already kind of welling up in me, but not enough to, you know, to make me change. And he said, son, you don't love me or your mother. He said, if you don't know, love, if you don't know God, you don't know love. And for him to tell me that I didn't love my mom was heart-wrenching to me. And mom was standing right there. And I said to him, Dad, that's not true. He says, yes, it is. You don't know God. Do you know God? I said, no. So you don't know love. You should mention that your dad had recently become a Christian himself. Yeah, that is true. That uh, my brother Jeff was kind of on this path of seeking God on his own when I was off surfing and lifeguarding and all this stuff. So he went to Lausanne, Switzerland on his journey. And this is where, with YWAM, and this is where he had met uh, Gordon Olson and Harry Kahn and heard their teaching. And he was in contact with my mom and dad. And my mom and dad experienced a kind of a revival within their own hearts and began to see that they were just living a pretense. My dad just had a form of religion. And apparently, I didn't witness this, I wasn't around, but apparently my mom and dad got right with God, you know, through with some of the things that Jeff was saying to them. So he was in a better state at this point in time. And this is when, you know, he said this to me. And it, it really it had a real impact on me. And I'll say that a couple of things that I did have going for myself is that I never claimed to be a Christian. I always saw Christians as hypocrites, and I wasn't about to be a hypocrite. I knew I wasn't, so I never claimed to be a Christian. So I didn't live this fake life, and I didn't have a lot of baggage. I wasn't indoctrinated. I didn't have any false theologies, you know, that had to be dealt with. I just simply knew that I wasn't a Christian. So when my dad said this to me, I couldn't even hardly respond, and I just got up, went back to my room, and by the way, I'm 20 years old now, and I just started to weep. I just cried and cried, and of course, my dad tells me that my mom wanted to immediately go into me and comfort me, but he had told her no, said, leave him alone. So I don't know how long it was. I mean, my pillow was sopping wet, the bed was wet. I was just crying, just going, I, just, I am miserable. I'm just, and here's this other person that's a Mormon, and I, I can't help her. She, who am I to tell her what the truth is, you know, about, about, about God or about anything? Well, eventually mom and dad did come in, and they just laid their hands on me and prayed for me. I don't remember what they were saying, but I just laid there, and then it was just like a switch. And this calmness came over me, and I just raised up. I looked at both of them and says, I know what I need to do. And I went back and went to sleep. I don't know if I've had such a good sleep in a long, long time. Early that morning, I woke up, I got out of bed, I simply got on my knees, and I said, I, I, I want to disregard everything I've been told. Told by men, what men say is right, what men say is wrong, how I should live, what I should do. I just you know what, I'm going to set it all aside. I'm not going to do another thing until I know it's the right thing to do, that it's what I should do. And I said, there's something greater than me. And so I knew that the term God, but I said, I'm not going to call you God until I know that's what you want to be called. <laughs> so I said, you who are greater than me, you, some, I came from somewhere. All of this earth and universe came from somewhere. And it's you who are greater than me. And if you're there, it's for you to reveal yourself to me. I, I want to know who you are. And immediately they said, well, this being, this whatever is greater than me, has the term God. So I said, okay, I'm going to call you God. This is who you are. You, you're God, and I, I want to know who you are and what, what it is that I should do. And I'm going to leave it up to you to reveal yourself. Show me what, how I should live. And immediately, my eyes turned to my Bible, who my mom and dad had bought me this Bible years and years and years ago. I never read it, never cracked it. 
In fact, at this point in my life, I never read a book. Not one book. I'd been to four colleges, <laughs> kicked out of most, or lost my scholarships, and never read a, a book completely. So there it was, the scriptures laying right there. And it's the, this is your word to me. This is how you're going to reveal yourself to me. And I'm going to disregard what men say, and I want you to show me what you have to say. So I began to read. I was praying. I opened that book, and immediately I started. I didn't really understand the Old Testament, New Testament. I knew enough that, you know, the New Testament is newer, so I'm going to start there. And I started to read Matthew, and, and I read Matthew 5, I read 6, and 7. And I said, Lord, show me who I am. I need to know who I am. I'm not reading this to point out anybody else's faults. I want to know what my faults are. And I began to see that that's me. That's me. That's talking about me. And here's just a few of the verses. that I, I got out my old, that old Bible, and I practically had a quarter of the Bible underlined, so I, I can't read you all of them. I'd be reading all the Scripture to you. But some of these that really stood out to me, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and the things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's in Galatians 5. Romans 2. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To those of you who preserve in doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. John, Gospel of John, he who loves his, his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world should keep it to eternal life. Therefore, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Then I came across these passages. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I began to read these passages and seeing it just was such a heavy weight of exposing who I was and a realization that nothing is secret. I have kept this understanding since the day of my conversion that nothing is hidden from God. There is no secret with Him. So why pretend that nobody knows? Why try to keep a secret? Why not expose exactly who I am? God knows already. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a carouser. I got a filthy mouth. I'm selfish at the core. I cheat people. I make fun of people. I have so many people I need to make right. These offenses, these sins against them. So I began to see this and I just broke and just asked God. And just, it was more of a sorrow. I'm sorry. It wasn't even so much forgive me as this, I'm so sorry that. that this is who I am, this is what I've become, and this is how I've treated people. So immediately, of course, I would feel a time of refreshing. I knew God was forgiving me as I was crying out to Jesus that I no longer wanted to hurt him or rebel against him. And I knew that Jesus came that I could be saved, you know, that I could uh, be forgiven of these sins that I had lived. So I would come out of my room for the next two weeks. I would spend this time in scripture, reading and reading and reading and applying it to myself. And in the first six months, I read through the New Testament 27 times. I, because of my brother Jeff, 
I got introduced to Harry Kahn, to Gordon Olson, to Charles Finney. So immediately I wanted to get things to read. So I, I was able to find these pamphlets from Men for Missions, One Way Fellowship. And I started reading Finney, True and False Repentance, True and False Conversion, Three Types of Professing Christians, and Systematic Theology. I just started to absorb and read, which helped gave me clarity as to what I was reading in Scripture. So I knew what I had to do as I got my own life right with the Lord. Now I had to make things right with others. So I don't know all the time into this. It just all happened within the six-month period, and specifically in the first two weeks. So, of course, I went to my mom, went to my dad. I asked for their forgiveness. I made it real clear, and I told them the person that I was, and how I'd been deceiving them, taking advantage of them, had them crying, of course, and they forgave me. I went to my brother, asked him for forgiveness, and I knew I had to go to others, and I just said, Lord, the rest of my life, all I'm going to be doing is making a restitution. There are so many people, i got to go back to Colorado, I'm going to go down to San Clemente. All the people that I would heard said evil things to and, and made fun of, so I just started right there. I went over to San Jose, came up to the swim coach there, and here I'm just, I'm set free. My heart is new, my heart is refreshed, I am a new creature. Everything that scripture said, I'm transformed. That old man is dead. I have nothing to do with him anymore. Now it's a new life, it's a new walk, it's a new understanding, a whole new perspective on life. And now I'm just a sojourner here. The things of the world, I quit surfing. I had trophies, some this high, dozens and dozens of them, and medals, and I threw them all in the garbage. I had multiple albums, Rolling Stones, you know, America, all these, I can't even remember some of them. Jethro Tull, Led Zeppelin, broke them all. Just broke them, threw them in the garbage. Wanted to get rid of everything. Sold my surfboard, sold my wetsuit. I just ridded myself of everything that was in my life. No, and it, and it wasn't that I was giving it up. It wasn't a, out of a duty. It wasn't out of a, I'm not supposed to do these things anymore. I had no desire for them anymore. You just... It, you have a whole new mindset as to what you want to live for, what's important now. It was about loving God and loving others and spreading this message, this gospel message. We're only here for a short period of time, and these are all it's just deception, momentary pleasures. They're not going to bring you satisfaction. They're not going to bring you true happiness. Though I was not seeking that. That's not what I was wanting, is happiness for myself or to be saved and not go to hell. I simply didn't want to hurt God anymore or hurt others. And I wanted to see the world for how God sees it. And to be set free now to have a clear conscience, not to have to be lying to cover up other lies. Now I can look at somebody right in the face and know I'm not hiding anything from them. I've expressed and told them everything that I had done and asked them for forgiveness. So restored relationships and friendships, true friendships. So I went to this coach, and I walked up to him, man, I'm just, I'm just as happy as I can be. I'm just on fire. And I go up to him and say, coach, so I, I want to, do you have a moment? I want to, I've got some things I need to ask you. He says, yeah, come on in, you know. It's, I had uh, taken advantage of him. He, he wasn't very happy with me. Uh, some of our swim meets, I would swim and just toy with the competitor, the guy I was swimming against, like University of Oregon or whatever. I, like, I swim backstroke. So I'd let my opponent get a little bit ahead of me. i just let him get a little bit ahead of me, and the coach is, come on, hey, pick it up, pick it up, you know. And then I'd go ahead of him, then I'd slow down, let him get ahead of me. i just toy with him, and just to drive the coach nuts. And, you know, then after the last minute, the last 10 yards, I'd sprint and I'd win. And it kind of he's just shaking his head at me, you know, just putting up with this. So I, I was doing the kind of stuff constantly. In fact, that when we swam against Oregon, after the swim meet, I hooked up with some of the guys on the other team and found this guy who had a trailer. And I said, let's have a party. I said, uh, let's put out some flyers. So we 
put flyers and said, uh, we'll buy a keg. Our team pitched in, their team pitched in. We bought a couple of kegs of beer. We put these flyers out, put the address, free beer at this address. There were 300 people there. I, I instigated that, and it was in this trailer. And uh, after that incident, college campus, security and everything came and kicked us all out. The police came. The college said, no more. You, you can't come to this college. You're not on our schedule anymore because of that party. And uh, so things were a wreck, and this coach had every, every reason to not be happy with me. But I went up to him, I looked him right in the eye, and I said, look, coach, I've sinned against you, I've wronged you. And I began, and he, you know, he kind of put his head down to, Dave, that's okay. I said, coach, I want to, I want to tell you what's, what's going on in my life. And I, I enumerated everything. I'd taken advantage of him. I wasn't a, you know, a good athlete for him. I took advantage of going to Hawaii, and I just laid it out, and I lied to him and deceived him, and he was just like, he didn't want to look at me. He said, it's all right, Dave, it's all right, Dave. And I said, will you forgive me? He says, yeah, yeah, you're forgiven. But I could see in his, what was happening in him. He, I think he was coming under conviction as I was ex, you know, uh, confessing to him and telling him and seeking his forgiveness that he knew what kind of life that he was living. So I was on that path that this is what I needed to do. And shortly after that, I think the Lord showed me that he was satisfied with my heart willingness to do this and that I no longer had to pursue that actively like I was doing. But when opportunity would avail, I would, would make restitution, but I didn't have to go back. Of course, I wrote a letter to the coach in Colorado and wrote some letters trying to call some people. And then the Lord just said, you, I know that you're willing, that you want to do this. And he wanted me to move on and to, to do and to have a, uh, some purpose to life other than just, you know, making restitution with people. So sure enough, uh, over the next six months, I, I read Finney's Systematic Theology, I read Gordon Olson's manual, I read all these pamphlets, all these books, and uh, started to build and grow in understanding and knowledge, and my life was changing dramatically. And, then we started, uh, of course, on Sundays, we'd go to the this first church that my parents had been attending was a kind of a church of Christ, and uh, I would go there, and one evening service, I stood up, and I said, this isn't true, what the preacher was praising, this is false, this is not true. And I forget what I said, but of course, I wasn't welcome there anymore, and so we started attending another church. And this was a larger church, non-denominational, kind of a charismatic background. And Jeff was home now, and we were attending this church. And after church, I just start sharing with other, some of the other young people. I'm still in my early 20s, and I'd have five, and then six, and then 10, and 15, and then 20 kids. These young 20-year-olds and teenagers all around me. And I'm telling them about the victory that we can have in Christ, and the life, and the the power of God, and what's true about sin, and what's true about righteousness and holy living, and what had transpired in my life, and that the struggling that you're experiencing doesn't, you don't need to struggle with this. You need to repent of these things. Well, there were some church leaders that would get in the crowd, and then they would come up and confront me, and then eventually I was told, you need to be quiet. You're disrupting, you're, you're causing turmoil. Well, one of those kids, one of those young people, ended up uh, marrying my, my brother. <laughs> Her name was Teresa. She ended up marrying Joe. So church after church, I mean, we, uh, we weren't welcomed. And honestly, this was really surprising to me. I thought every Christian, you know, these, that would go to these churches had experienced what I had experienced. And we were walking in victory and had a clear conscience. And that wasn't the case. And it was extremely frustrating to me. Well, then that opportunity came. Um, well, our family started a construction business. Um, that's how I got into building. 
My dad used to be in building, and so we started a family business and building houses. So I'm a lifeguard now turned carpenter and contractor, you know, building. Saved a little money and had an opportunity to go to a school in Minneapolis, one way theological seminary or uh, Bible college school. And it was just a group of students that would come to this church building and different men would come in and, and teach uh, for a week. And one of the men that came was Harry Kahn. And when I first arrived, one of the first people I met was <laughs> Faithy. I had uh, listened to Harry Kahn's tapes and I always was hearing about Faithy and Nancy and Pompey, that's their dog. <laughs> Little did I know that I would meet Faithy. And of course, uh, while we went to school, we, you know, began a friendship. And being there at the school, I was around Faith all the time. So we never dated. Um, I was trying to figure out if I was uh, ever going to marry or if I was going to be <coughs> single and be an evangelist or preach or travel. So I was trying to determine what I was going to do. And uh, I could sense that. Faith had an interest in me, and I certainly was interested in her, but I never let her know that because I, I didn't want it to hurt her. I wanted to kind of guard her heart, and so as I prayed through this, I decided that, you know, I, I wanted to marry Faith if she would marry me. So we'd never been on a date, and I asked if I could meet her one night in uh, the sanctuary, and we went in there. She thought I was going to ask her out on our first date, and I asked her if I could be her husband. <laughs> and she said yes. But that was an unusual, you know, we spent days and days, we did dishes together, we, you know, ate together, so it was unusual, you know, that we were able to get to know each other. And it was funny, uh, before that, her dad had come to teach, and when he was leaving after his week, uh, he addressing the students, and he said, Dave, can I talk to you out in the hall? I said, oh. So I went out there, and I was following him, and then he turns, and he goes, you know, you're the kind of son I always wanted my daughter to marry, and he coaxed me. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I had this blessing, and so we were married, and, uh, you know, moved back, and that was 43 years ago. And, uh, and I'm 67 now, so, you know, my conversion happened when I was 20. I want to read you something. Some of my studies, something I like to, to study, is I like to look at what the early uh, church leaders taught, what the early church Christians, you know, the first 100 years, first 200 years after Jesus, what did these men teach? I mean, there's writings, and they've been translated, and we have access to them. Well, one of these uh, writings that happened to be a letter, okay, that I found in uh, one of my books, and it, it's from uh, 125 A.D., so 125 years after Jesus. This letter was written by a Roman, and he was a non-believer. And he'd been sent out by the emperor at that time, to investigate who these Christians are and are the kind of assess, are they a threat? Who, you know, who are these Christians? Well, they gave a report and he wrote a letter back to this emperor, and this letter's been preserved. I want to read to you what a non Christian says about these Christians of that day. And I want you to think about it and, and think in your mind if a non Christian was to observe your life and how you're living your life, what kind of report would they give about you back to uh, some kind of leader? The Christians, O king, went about and searched, and they have found the truth, as I have learned from their writings. They have come nearer to the truth and genuine knowledge than the rest of the nations. For they know and trust in God, the creator of heaven and earth, in whom and from whom are all things. Therefore, they do not commit adultery or fornication. They do not bear false witness. They do not embezzle what is held in pledge, nor do they covet that which is not theirs. They honor father and mother and show kindness to those who are near to them. 
Whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. They do not worship idols made in the likeness of men. Whenever they want whatever they would not wish others to do to them, they do not do to others. They do not eat food that is consecrated to idols, for they are pure. They comfort their oppressors and make them their friends. They do good to their enemies. Their women, O king, are pure as virgins, and their daughters are modest. Their men keep themselves from every unlawful union and from all uncleanness, in hope of a reward in the world to come. Furthermore, if any of them have male or female slaves or children, out of love towards them, they persuade them to become Christians. When they have done so, they call them brothers without any distinction. They do not worship strange gods, and they go their way in all modesty and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. They do not turn away from their care for widows, and they deliver the orphans and they deliver the orphan from anyone who treats them, treats him harshly. He who has gives to him who has not, and this is done without boasting. When they see a stranger, they take him into their homes, and they rejoice over him as a very brother. For they do not call themselves brother after the flesh, but brothers after the spirit and in God. Whenever one of the poor among them passes from this world, each one of them gives heed to him according to his ability and carefully sees to his burial. And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted because of the name of their Christ, all of them carefully attend to his needs. If it is possible to redeem him, they set him free. And if there are any poor or needy among them, but if they have no spare food to give, they fast two or, three do two or three days in order to supply the necessary food to the needy. Their fellow men, they follow the commandments of their Christ with much care, living justly and seriously, just as the Lord their God commanded them. Every morning and every hour they give thanks and praise to God for his loving kindness to them. They give thanksgiving to him for their food and drink. If any righteous man among them passes from this world, they rejoice and offer thanks to God. They escort his body as if he were sitting out, setting out from one place to go to another nearby. And when his children, and when a child has been born to any of them, they give thanks to God. This was a letter describing the Christians of that day. <laughs> And it was very moving to me to think, what would somebody write about me and what kind of life I'm living? Thank you for your time. Who wrote that, by the way? His name is Aristides. Aristides. Okay. Well, that was a good one. Well, thank you, Dave. That was a wonderful testimony. I think all of us may have similar things we can relate to that. Some of us, you know, our testimonies are going to be different, but the main thing to take away from that is he heard the call and he responded in the manner that God wanted him to. He wants us all to respond in that way. That's where we repentant heart and heart that says, I'm going to follow you now. So that's wonderful. All right, let's close in prayer. And again, there's church at Jesse's tonight for those who want to go. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the lives that are changed. The Bible says that there is great rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Lord, what a wonderful thing. And Lord, we know that we all have things that in our lives that we regret, and there may be some that have not yet reconciled all those things to you. So I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would do its convicting work. It would reach inside those hearts and it would challenge those minds that are wrestling with this. Dave wrestled with it. The Lord, with the help and power of the Holy Spirit, he overcame, which is what we're supposed to do. So I ask that you would touch the hearts here tonight, today, that have been pricked. And if there is anybody who needs to make that commitment, to need who needs to make that change in their lives, I pray your Holy Spirit would just drive that point home, Lord, so that they would not rest without making it right. Lord, 
There's nothing more important in this world than being right with you, or a clear conscience, a relationship with you, and restitution, and relationship with those that we've offended and harmed. So we just ask that you would touch each one of us, Lord. Those of us who are Christian, Lord, I pray you just encourage our hearts. Just a moment.